Jeff, climbing Mayans Mount Katahdin in January isn't exactly the ideal time for a hike, is it? And as you can tell by my voice, I'm already sick, Jeff. Yeah, I get that. Winter hiking is a whole different animal, especially on Maine's tallest mountain, where weather conditions can turn drastic at like a moment's notice. But maybe we shouldn't go all the way to the summit anyway. Given how dangerous this can be in the winter, why are we up here at all, Jeff? I mean, couldn't we have waited for the spring or summer? We could have, Ray, but in warm months, I don't think we'd have any chance of finding the legendary creature that's set to cause this wild, cold weather. Today, we're searching for the Pomola. Hey, I'm Jeff Belanger, and welcome to episode 72 of the New England Legends podcast. And I'm Ray Osier. If you give us about 10 minutes of your time, we'll give you something strange to talk about today. For the last 72 weeks in a row, we've brought you weird but true tales from all over the Northeastern United States. We have. We're on a mission to document every legend in New England, one week and one story at a time. And we can only do that with your help. We get plenty of our story ideas from legendary listeners just like you. You can call or text us anytime. Yeah, you can do that at 617-444-9683. Contact us through our website. OurNewEnglandLegends.com Or join our super secret Facebook group of legend hunters. I could tell you where that is, but it's a secret. It is a secret. But no matter what, it's amazing to be on this journey with you. All right, Jeff. Mount Katahdin in Central Maine is a significant place for many different reasons. Very true. For one, this is the last stop, or the first stop, depending on which direction you're traveling, on the Appalachian Trail. Right. The Appalachian Trail, or the AT, as us experienced hikers call it, runs 2,200 miles between the top of Mount Katahdin in Maine to the summit of Spring Mountain in northern Georgia. Hundreds of hikers make the journey each year. Most start in the south and work their way up north, but some start north and then head south. Katahdin is 5,267 feet tall, and as we said, it is the tallest in Maine, but that's not the only reason this mountain is legendary. Another reason is a cold-weather creature who's said to live right around here somewhere. Right, the Pomola. Now, what is that? The Pomola has the body of a man, but giant wings like an eagle, and the head of a moose. According to the Penobscot Indians, who lived in central Maine for centuries, the Pomola is the god of thunder. And he lives up on this mountain somewhere near the top. And because this is the dwelling place of a god, you're not supposed to climb up here. So, in a way, we're kind of trespassing here, aren't we? We are. And locals have known being up here is a bad idea for centuries. In 1864, American author and literary treasure Henry David Thoreau published a book called The Maine Woods. He explored this region and wrote about this very legend. Thoreau said... The tops of mountains are among the unfinished parts of the globe. Whether it is a slight insult to the gods to climb and pry into their secrets and try their effect on our humanity, only daring and insolent men perchance go there. Simple races, as savages, do not climb mountains. Their tops are sacred and mysterious tracks never visited by them. Bamala is always angry with those who climb to the summit of Katahdin. So that's why we should avoid the summit? I'm not sure that will completely save us, but I am curious how far back this legend goes. It turns out that legends like the Pomola turn up in folklore all over the world. Really? Well, let's start at the beginning, Jeff. We always want to start there if we can. That's true. Uh, We can look back to Greek mythology. That's the start. Okay. Uh, The god Zeus had companions in battle. One of those was a group of siblings who were described as half-human, half-birds. The most famous being the goddess Nike. Nike like the sneaker company? The very same. She's the goddess of victory. Okay, that makes sense. And the idea also makes me think of Judeo-Christian imagery. I mean, the cherubim and seraphim were described as angelic beings with wings. In the Hebrew Bible, the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, describes the creature. I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. When you think of old biblical paintings, angels always have wings, though the Bible never actually says angels have wings. It describes angels as flying, but doesn't specifically mention the wings, not unless we're talking about cherubim 
and seraphim. So we fast forward to Native American legends, and we hear old stories of the Thunderbird. The Thunderbird is slightly different from the Pomola, though. Okay. For example, in the American Southwest, the Thunderbird is the size of a man with a giant wingspan. But the head is more bird-like, not moose-like. Huh. In other variations, the head is that of a man. But the name Thunderbird comes from the sound this creature makes when it flaps its wings. That's right. The wings are so mighty, their flapping makes the sound of thunder. And while all this might sound like some fun legend... Keep in mind that the United States Air Force has an elite demonstration squadron that flies at air shows all over the world. These pilots fly F-16s in tight formation and perform acrobatics in front of huge audiences. And the name of this flight team is, of course, the Thunderbirds. Right. They have giant birds painted on the underside of those F-16s. That's very cool that they named their team after the Thunderbird legend. And the Air Force team has been around since 1953. So basically, this giant half-man, half-bird has been in our popular culture in one way or another for over half a century. All right, but wait a minute. This bird man is starting to sound really familiar. Is it? Well, I'm thinking back to the 2002 movie, The Mothman Prophecies. Oh, right. Starring Richard Gere. Yes. That movie was based on the 1975 book of the same name by John Keel, who was a journalist of all things weird. Yeah, he was. The book and movie depict events that took place in Point Pleasant, West Virginia during 1966 and 1967. Mothman is one of those iconic cryptid stories. The first sighting in Point Pleasant occurred November 12th, 1966. Some guys are digging a grave when they see this flying creature the size of a man swoop low over some nearby trees. And three days later, two young couples are driving by an old abandoned World War II munitions plant just outside of town when their headlights sweep across the landscape. And they see this, quote, large man with a 10-foot wingspan. They said when the headlights hit the creature's eyes, they glowed red. This is the part of the account that doesn't get enough attention. What do you mean? Well, most describe Mothman as having glowing red eyes, as if the eyes produce glowing light. Yeah, that's, that's the way I've heard it. But this account said the eyes only glowed in the reflection of the headlights. Oh, good point. I can tell you I've seen my cat's eyes glow in my headlights when I pull into the driveway at night. Yeah, of course. Well, many animals have glowing eyes when the light hits them just right. Right. And I can show you plenty of photos I've taken of people. If I use the camera flash, sometimes the image shows their eyes glowing red. Right. So I looked into this. Okay. Human eyes glow red in some photographs because the flash of the camera hits the back of our eyes in the retina. Okay. The retina is full of blood vessels, so when the light bounces back from our eyes, it's shining back through our semi-translucent blood vessels, which are full of flowing red blood. Okay. So our blood makes our eyes red in photos. You know, that's both gross and awesome (laughs) at the same time. Well, animals like cats, dogs, deer, and other creatures have better night vision than we do. And just behind their retinas, they have a layer called tapetinum lucinum. This allows nocturnal animals to get a second pass at the limited light that passes through their eyes. They also have blood vessels back there, but the chemical compounds in the tapetum lucidum are more mirror-like, so they reflect. So what you're saying in the case of Mothman is that the eyes don't produce light. Exactly. And you're saying if we believe the eyewitness accounts, Mothman's eyes reflect light more similarly to a human than an animal. Yes. That's kind of spooky. Well, there were more Mothman sightings in the coming days before things quieted down for a bit. Uh, But the story in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, comes to head on December 15, 1967, almost 13 months after the first sighting. Okay. Because it was on that day that the Silver Bridge in town collapsed and it killed 46 motorists. Oh, that was a horrible tragedy. It was. And that got some locals to think that maybe some of these sightings were some kind of harbinger, a, a warning that disaster was coming. Oh, of course, and humans do that, don't we? Well, do, do what? In order to make sense of things, we try to make connections. I mean, we want to find a reason for the chaotic events that happen in our world because we'd rather believe there's some kind of plan or grand design rather than random acts of destruction. It's, it's how conspiracy theories are born. How do you mean? The second law of thermodynamics is entropy, which basically means the universe has always been moving from an ordered state to a disordered state. Just before the Big Bang, we had order. Then, an explosion. And things have become more disordered ever since. I mean, you've no doubt dropped a beer glass in your day and watched it shatter on the floor. 
Yep, and each time it was a tragedy. <laughs> of course it was. But you've never watched the shattered beer glass reassemble itself into a hole. That's true. And the beer is lost forever, unfortunately. I know. That is the worst part. So horrible, random tragedies or acts of violence occur, like the Silver Bridge collapsed in 1967, or 9-11, or Sandy Hook. And we look to make some order to it with some kind of conspiracy theory that helps some people sleep better at night, believing someone planned it as part of some bigger purpose. But that doesn't change the tragedies in any way. So Mothman may not have anything to do with the Silver Bridge collapse. Exactly. Just two separate events linked by proximity. It happens. And that brings us right back to the Pomola on Mount Katahdin. Here on Mount Katahdin, the weather can change fast. The wind can whip, the cold can bite, rain and blizzard conditions can move in faster than you can hike to safety. Chaos. Right. And we need something to blame, right? So we blame the Pomola. And what's wild is that the Pomola is, by all descriptions, a thunderbird, just like Mothman. But it's got a local twist. You mean the head of a moose? Right. Maybe no one gets a clear look at the creature and it's easier for people in Maine to assume it's more moose-like than man-like. So you think there's anything to this Pomola legend? Is there really something hunting people who dare to climb Mount Katahdin? Here's the thing, Ray. Since 1926, there have been 22 deaths in this area around Mount Katahdin. And we know there were deaths before 1926. We just don't have the meticulous records we've had since Baxter State Park opened here in 1931. Most people have died from some mishap on the trails, and usually from hypothermia. Some of these people were experienced hikers, too. So do we blame the circumstances or the Pomola? I guess we'll never know. I mean, we can't interview the dead. I'm thinking that maybe it's time we head back down and get off Mount Katahdin. Strange monsters lurk all over New England, don't they, Ray? That they do. Now, if you enjoy our stories each week, we invite you to become a patron. Just go to patreon.com slash New England Legends, and for as little as three bucks a month, you get early access to new episodes. You get to hear bonus episodes that no one else gets to listen to, and you can be a bigger part of this movement to chronicle and experience every legend in New England. We'd like to thank Dave Schrader from Beyond the Darkness podcast and Tim Ellis from the Creaking Door podcast for lending their voice acting talents this week. And our theme music is by John Judd. Until next time, remember, the bazaar is closer than you think. Closer than you think.